This is Star Talk. This is Star Talk Radio. Welcome to the first installment in a series of special edition cosmic queries that we have dubbed Make America Smart Again. I'm your host and personal astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and joining me today as my co-host is someone who is no stranger to Star Talk Radio, professional comedian Chuck Nice. Chuck. Um, hey, Neil. How are you? I like, the, I like the fact you put professional on the end of that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was very, very kind of you. That may be the first time I've done that. Yeah, exactly. You finally pay your rent yeah, off of your comedy. Clearly, clearly I am uh, paying my mortgage from comedy now, and somehow you got that information. I got that. <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, today, we're talking about immigration policy, specifically the contributions that immigrants and descendants of immigrants have made to science, technology, engineering, and math in this country. Now, you know I'm not going to do that alone. I'd hardly do any of this alone. So to help us out, we brought in special guest, the, the one, the only, Fareed Zakaria. Yes. Exclamation point. That's right. Do you, do you have an exclamation point, like, born with your name? Uh, well, I was hoping... It deserves one. I was hoping to be called professional something or the other, <laughs> but, but I guess I'm just Fareed Zakaria. <laughs> I feel like I'm a professional, but... Okay. Something. For the next, for the next 40 minutes, for, you're our professional, exactly. right? Professional. So, uh, Fareed is an Indian-American journalist and author, and he's also host of CNN's Fareed Zakaria GPS. GPS. Right. I assume I'm a fan. I, I like the, the the you know the encore. Yes, without a doubt. <laughs> that, that's something that deserves to be said in stereo. Yeah, don't you go ahead, right? GPS. Yes. <laughs> he also writes a weekly column for the Washington Post. So Fareed, thanks for joining us. And we've been friends for a while, so I didn't just pick you up Long off time, the street. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 So so I I did some homework on you, and you have an extraordinary academic pedigree to be doing what you're doing. So many pundits out there, they're kind of self-made, they're, you know, they did a little bit of their own reading and they, they have strong opinions and people love hearing, you know, vociferously voiced opinions. And you always have this sort of calm voice and you have all this academic substrate there. So- Isn't that always the case though? Isn't it always the guy who has an extensive and impressive academic uh, pedigree? They don't have to scream. They don't scream. <laughs> They're the guys that are just like, oh, okay, so you feel that way, huh? <laughs> oh, good for you. Like, those are the yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, it's well. always the guy who doesn't know anything that's just like, I'm telling you now. <laughs> that's just the way it is. Like, yeah. I think of myself as a lapsed academic. Maybe a little bit like you. I mean, I don't know if you still consider yourself a practicing professor. In my mind, but, I am, yeah. whether or not uh, in practice. I mean, whether I try. The profession would regard you as such. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that. I give all this up and just go back to the lab, and then you'll, you'll never find me again. <laughs> so I want to just explore this. I, what I bring to the table for you to react to is the fact that science in the United States, which really came of age in the 20th century, um, with the uh, there were many drivers, but let's take, for example, the formation of the National Science Foundation. But there were earlier indications. Go back to Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. who in 1963, when he clearly had other priorities, yes. okay, he signed into law that created the National Academy of Sciences, recognizing what role science was playing in Europe. And how important it was, saying, "Hey, we get me some of that for our country." And he also created the land grant college system, so he had tremendous foresight into the role of science and technology as a fundamental driver of everything the United States would become. So now I look at uh, I'm closer to physics than I am uh, biology, of course. So I look at things like the Manhattan Project, so crucial to what became 20th century um, uh, politics and science, and it landed us where we became, where we were for the entire second half of the 20th century. And most of those scientists were foreign born nationals. And, and so what, what, what from your, from your worldview, how, could you just explain how this works? Just, you know, it's, it's fascinating. You're, you're absolutely right 
to focus on the beginnings because we think that America was always the most scientifically innovative country in the world. You know, we look at the Nobel Prizes and we take it for granted. 5% of the world's population, we get about 75% of the world's prizes. And that doesn't even count Obama's Peace Prize, which I regard as kind of a weird one mm -hmm. uh, in his oh, first year of office. Come on, it's like a Lifetime <laughs> Achievement Award. Yeah. No, no, you know, at, at, at age 25. At age 25. It's, you know, it's like if, when you didn't really earn this, but we got to give it to you just because we like exactly. you. Exactly. But if you look at the early 20th century, 1910, 1914, I forget the exact date, Germany had won more prizes in science, Nobel Prize in science, than Britain and the United States put together. So the U.S. becomes a powerhouse in science basically for three big reasons. The first is the destruction of Europe. Right. Basically, World War One, World War II, Great Depression, the place gets flattened, all the universities shut with, down. With the last man standing. Mm -hmm. With the last man standing, and particularly Germany gets destroyed. Right. Germany was the scientific uh, superpower. Second, we take in all these immigrants. People forget, even in the 30s, with all the restrictions, 100,000 Jews came in from Europe. Many of them scientists. As you say, many of them worked on the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. After that, of course, the door opens even wider. And the third is massive government funding. So let's think about it. Europe ain't destroyed anymore. Government funding is down to half what it used to be. Our only hope, frankly, is that we keep taking in the best and brightest in the world. Otherwise, you, you already see the world catching up. Um, you already see that you know Japanese uh, scientists win Nobel prizes routinely. That you now have yes. the Chinese getting in on the action. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have to recognize That's just the beginning there. Right, we're five percent of the world. We want to make sure that we're not winning just five percent of the Nobel prizes. Wow. That. Well, that's I mean that 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 very fact then is enabled only if you then not only have access to but mutual interest in coming to the world's greatest talent, and the world's greatest talent isn't always in your country because everybody's human and innovation is not some uh, nobody has a monopoly on no, 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 innovation. It's just right. a matter of opportunity to express it. And and you know what I've noticed something, Neil, which you probably know. Um, I was for, for a while a trustee of the college I went to, Yale, and there was a lot. There are a lot of government funding. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you see, way, you see the way he did that. No, but, but listen, the, the <laughs> point, you know what I like about the way the Fareed just did that. I too? dropped it. He was, he was like a, it was like a a, a subtext. A, you know what I mean? A small it was, college it was a in New Haven. Like it was a little afterthought. You know, and the college that I went to. Yale. Yale. Yeah, yeah. Yale. So, so here's the point. <laughs> Yale is private, of course. A lot of government cuts to public universities, some of the great public universities in America. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that we were had access to better and better scientists who were... While that was leaving. happening. Well, because the University of Arizona is cutting funding. You know, Michigan State is cutting funding. So um, Berkeley, you know. Now, it actually happened less at Berkeley than anywhere else. But what I was struck by, I mean, being a New Yorker, being in the world that you and I are in, Neil... I thought we were going to have to offer these guys more money. No, the scientists only cared about what they have good labs and good colleagues right. because they wanted to be around other smart scientists. They wanted right. to be able to have graduate students who were good. So it makes me, I mean, the point you're making, people will come to where other smart people are. That's the magnet that attracts you. You know what's funny is that what you just said is just a fact of human nature. When you want to do well, when you want to win, when you want to be the best, then your own personal gain tends to take a back seat to the accomplishment of a greater goal. For instance, sports stars who'll take a salary cut so that really good players can stay on their team. Mm -hmm. Or they'll give up being the number one guy on a team to go be in a team effort where they're pretty much guaranteed a championship. Right, right. This is this is part of the way we think. Oh, I'm going to tell your agent that you voluntarily agreed to take a pay cut <laughs> That's to right. be at the right comedy club. <laughs> Two things are going to have to happen. One, uh, you're going to have to tell my agent to get me paid first. <laughs> and then you can tell him I'm willing to take that pay cut. <laughs> so, Fareed, I hadn't fully... Uh, that was like a missing piece of my talk total worldview of this, that it's not just simply come here because you're being persecuted there. It's come here because there are other really smart people here, and then the the, the resonance of this intellectual um, uh, uh, community will not only 
benefit you, but it'll benefit all of science. And and any good scientist is, will tell you, I want to see science grow, even if I'm not part of it, because there's a curiosity that we all carry to this frontier, and whoever can move it, that's great. Exactly. I mean, you find that one of the things the Chinese were having difficulty, they've been trying to recruit back some of the best and brightest- That we trained here. We, that the United States trained here. And they were fine. They would say to them, we'll build you the biggest lab, we'll, we'll give you unlimited research funds. What the, a lot of Chinese professors were saying is we don't have the best graduate students. We want to work with the best graduate students, and those people are at Berkeley or Harvard. Or, now that's changed. Now uh, Beijing University and Tsinghua in particular have superb graduate students. And so the, you're beginning to see all many of the best and brightest go back to China. So when I go back to, uh, again, the Manhattan Project, I go back to the Apollo Project, each of those had sort of military motivations. Uh, I mean, we don't like remembering Apollo as military, but NASA was in response, of course, to Sputnik and the threat that that, that we perceived by that. But you look at, uh, you look at, there was, of course, Einstein came over. So, like you said, this whole flux of Jewish scientists. Then after the Second World War, we build our space program on the back of Werner von Braun, for example. Mm -hmm. And now you have all these people. You know, Enrico Fermi. We have a labs named after this guy. Fermi Labs. Okay. He's Italian. His wife is Jewish. And all of this is going on. And we say, this is America. That's exactly right. It's not even being fine toothed. Yeah. Picked for for what that is, it's just of course, and and of course to just uh, em emphasize one piece of this, massive government funding. People don't like to to, uh -huh. to point this out when you talk about I think gov all government funding is bad. You you know then you say oh the government shouldn't pick winners or losers. So look at the microchip industry. The, uh -huh. the beating heart of the computer revolution is the microchip, right? Texas Instruments in, uh, basically invents it, and then the, the U.S. government through uh, the the Air Force buys something like 60 to 70% of all microchips produced. The cost initially is 1,000 per microchip. It goes down to $30 per microchip because the government keeps buying it. You know, it basically allows for scale, which then drops the price. Exactly the same thing that, pe that pe people are trying to do in the solar industry or the wind industry. Is, right? Are the people in the government who are doing this, they have this foresight? Are you telling me this? Well, we have. We, we I normally we give that have, much credit yeah. to government officials. I, I think we have. Uh, if you look at DARPA, which is the agency in the Defense uh, Department that does this, there's. We actually, super, recently interviewed really the head good. of DARPA really, for StarTalk. Yeah, really good. Um, Defense Advanced Projects Research. Agency, agency, yes. and then and it, and it, there was a uh, ARPANET, which is the the precursor to the internet, was in mm -hmm. fact you know came up. The Defense Department in fact uh, invents it. Uh, GPS uh, is 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 part of the Defense Department. Right, you, you stole know, that name. I yes. think I think that the main thing we have to realize is you have to throw a lot of resources at the science is expensive. Basic research is the most important, right. but you also need um, the development of technologies. Of course, you're going to miss lots. So of course, some companies like Solyndra will go bankrupt. But you know, if you think about it, the same time the government made a loan to Solyndra for about $600 million, it made a loan to Tesla for $600 million. Now, what happened? Solyndra went bankrupt. Tesla has, go has gone up 10,000%. Right. Guess who, who made all that money? The private sector, the shareholders, and Elon Musk. So when the government loses the money, we, the taxpayers, take the blame. But we don't get the upside. That's just the nature of it. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for well, science. We do get the upside in the sense that if the government births an industry, yes, exactly. then the industry has tax base that comes back to the government. Exactly. And, 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 and each scientific in invention produces a new another one. Another one, right. Yes. You know. yes. And just for the record, StarTalk was birthed by the government. On a, on a National Science Foundation grant. They believed the in was what it. we were trying to do. So that, so that was a little more like the Solyndra one, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, for I me, thought we were doing it. okay. I don't know. Uh, you know, you go. I, I just I look in our notes for this. That apparently, um, you know, of course, Benjamin Franklin. Let's go back to him. One of the first great scientists mm -hmm. of, the, of the United States. Uh, he, uh, I mean, I. He wrote books on research and electricity. So he's he's probably he might even be been a better scientist than founding father. I mean, if you look at what his record is and what Absolutely. he discovered and the books that he had published, but regardless, uh, he, he, his parents fled England because of religious persecution. And he's here, and so he's basically an immigrant, his immigrant lineage, which would have been easy back then, yeah, I guess. That's pretty cool. That, see, the thing is, though, it uh, doesn't really count when you're 
Well, you're not brown. So, uh, <laughs> that that? Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, you know, it's uh, just the way it works. So let's, get, let's get to that. It's, no, it's, there are rules. To that. There are rules. Let's get to that. So we have these. I could cite all the, the famous scientists of the 20th century that shaped modern. Uh, you know, we have Werner von Braun from Germany who birthed. The, he he basically designed the Saturn V rocket that got us to the moon because he had that knowledge and uh, and and awareness from his from developing the V two rocket. In, uh, that was basically the first ballistic missile. It left Earth's atmosphere, found its target, fell on the target. Right. That's that's a ballistic missile. V two okay. being the rockets that the Germans developed and and ra- and and uh, rained on London in 1940. Correct. Five. Correct. Although rain would be a little too delicate a word for what these things did. <laughs> uh, so they, yeah, they fall out of the sky supersonically. So you, it's not a, it's not like. Not a whistle. Yeah, no, you do not. You don't, it's just right. you're walking, and then the block explodes. Right. Okay. That's how that. So how my that, dad was a graduate student in in, in London in 1945, uh, and was having coffee with a bunch of his friends in a cafe. Um, he was, st- and they said to him, "Stay for a while." He said, "No, I got to get back. I got to get some work done." He walks out. And he turns his back, and a V two rocket hit the cafe. Mm. Everyone there, every friend of his died. If he had just stayed, when they told him just have one more cup of coffee, he would have he would have been dead. Man, Damn. yeah. Then we wouldn't even be having this. Then we be having this conversation, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. No, or, or I think of it the other way. That's how. Sorry. How many others might I have been having conversation right. and not him? Not him. <laughs> because they would have had to exactly. say. And did exactly. he ever? Did he ever use that as a motivated factor to a factor to get you to do your work? <laughs> let me tell you something. That would do. It. Yeah, you know what? I got back to work and I'm alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, the different people are different. Right? My dad had had a tough upbringing. He was a self self made man, and he always said. I went through stuff I don't want you to ever have to go through. Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> that was uh-huh. his attitude. Yes. Well, let me just complete this list. Uh, Steve Jobs, as we know, um, uh, he, he, his, his family lineage is traceable to Syria, if I remember. Syria, the, so his actual father, father. Was, a, was a Syrian immigrant. Syrian, and uh, Elon Musk, a South African, uh, but via Sergey Canada. Brin, Sergey Brin, Google. Is and Google, right. All of this, all of this. And so, so... Not to mention all the real, I mean, the scientists. These are all we're talking about. We're trying just to, the entrepreneurs. Right, we're just talking about the entrepreneurs. If okay, so the now, scientists. devil's advocate. Um, this is a list of people any country would want. So... Do you say, yes, you can immigrate if you have these kinds of ambitions or if you're going to, if you're going to, we'll, we'll let you in if you go get a degree in, in engineering. I mean, is that, is, is that the devil's advocate posture here that has not yet been resolved in this conversation? So there's no question we should take any of those kinds of people. I mean, there's, I think Michael Bloomberg had the idea of if you get a PhD in, in science, you should have a green card stapled to your degree when you get it. Makes sense. And that makes a lot of sense. Makes sense. There's no question we that should. It was also, also um, Newt Gingrich uh, was a very yeah. strong posture yeah. on that. And I, and I think that, you know, that seems to me a no-brainer and one of the parts of immigration reform one hopes eventually mm-hmm. we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um, the harder question, as you say, is we take in lots of people who are not like that. That's called the family unification policy. I think we've probably taken too many any that way and too few who are who are skills and, mm-hmm. and brain based. But you know, there's also something to be said for the sheer drive mm-hmm. that um, that low skill immigrants bring. I, obviously, in the right numbers and in a way that can they can be integrated. Yeah. But the biggest problem for a rich country is you you lose that drive, you lose that hunger. I mean, you know, we all have children, and you know, the more fortunate the parents' circumstance, mm-hmm. the kids are going to be great. Fat and lazy. <laughs> they, <laughs> say it. They can't, say have, it. They say can't it. have the same drive, right? <laughs> right, right. And but but. United Arab- Emirates has a similar problem. It's a very wealthy country, right. but who's going to clean the laundry and right. who's going right. to... But but some guy who comes from, you know, Mexico or, or Guatemala, Honduras, who's willing to risk everything, abandon, you know, home cu- culture and come there, come here to wash dishes Just to 16 do that. hours a, d- a day, right. that's a certain kind of drive and energy. And by the way, that person might end up doing something remarkable. His... Children That's might end up doing something remarkable. The real thing you have to keep in mind is the children of those people tend to be the ones who have that same drive, right, but right. they are also educated here in America, which gives them a distinct advantage when it comes to a bigger achieving. drive than American with the same American education. There you go. So That's they're a golden. So what we're doing is we're creating better Americans. That's, we, that's all there is to it. We got to go to break. When we come back, more of our conversation on a special edition of Cosmic Queries. Let's make America smart again with my special guest, Fareed Zakaria, when we come back.
Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. We've been talking about the impact of immigration on science and technology in America. And we've got Chuck Nice to help me out here. Yes, sir. Deep thinking dude. Yeah, you know. As all good comics are, by the way. This is true. I was going to say, I try to keep that, uh, I try to lower expectations as much as possible, Neil. (laughs) Is that how that works? Exactly. (laughs) And we've got our in-studio guest, journalist, author, and longtime actual friend of mine, Fareed Zakaria. Fareed, uh, great to have you on the show. I just want to just get back in uh, just real quickly. So, so would you, uh, so when, when, um, if there's a policy that says we'll stop all immigration, evaluate it and say, okay, here is the proscenium through which you'll walk. If we judge that you will be the right person for this, is there a risk of that abuse with that? That kind of happened a hundred years ago, didn't it? The Northern Europeans, not the Southern Europeans. There was a lot of judgment being placed on who was worthy and who was not. I think the big danger is that we think we can we can identify talent and drive and ambition and creativity. And those are complicated things. So yes, we should do more skill base. We should probably do a little bit less family unification. We should get the balance right. We should- You don't mean immediate family. You mean extended family. Exactly. It's how you can basically- But by the way, I mean, again, in the old is in the 19th century, one person from a village in Sicily would come and then bring the whole village. Later. Yeah, right, right, right. So it's we have we have done that and we have managed to absorb it, and that is partly what has given this country the kind of diversity and 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 richness it has. But you know, in terms of balancing the numbers, maybe more more skill based, maybe less of this, as you say, extended family unification. But I really think it's important to remember. We don't know when we take in a ten-year-old kid uh, what that kid is going to be. Whether they, you know, if they may, he or she may be a poor Guatemalan. That doesn't mean that you know talent is sprinkled evenly throughout the, the planet. Mm-hmm. And you might be getting amazing people, even though they look like they're poor peasants from you know places that are not doing well in the world. So one other question before we get to to, to the queries. No worries. You, you solicit these from. Yes, from we the, have the queries from all over the internet and sorry. any incarnation where you can find Star Talk. So Fareed, th- there's the flip side of this that no one in America talks about. If we are so great that everyone wants to come to us. That's a brain drain for other countries. We're getting the best of other countries, sort of dr- sucking their intellectual capital into our borders. If we get a stronger world, we'll be less capable to do that even if we wanted to. So the way I think about this, Neil, it's a very good question. As you can imagine, having grown up in India and come here, I would hear this often. People would say, why are you leaving India? You know, the, your country needs you. But here's the truth. I actually do think... Talent is sprinkled throughout. There are millions and millions of talented Indians. I'm not that special. What's special is the environment that this country has created where smart and talented people can flourish. There's another way of putting this. There was a member of parliament, an opposition member of parliament, who stood up one day at the Indian parliament and asked the then prime minister, Indira Gandhi, he said, Madam uh, Prime Minister, can you explain to me one question? I notice when I look around the world, Indians seem to do really well everywhere except in India. <laughs> what does that tell you about how you run this country? Right. Oh. Right. Yeah, there's no answer. There's no good it's answer all, to that. It, It's right. all about creating an right. ecosystem yeah. where talent Talent can flourish. It's the problem in India or China or Africa. It's not that there aren't talented people. It's you haven't created the ecosystem that lets them flourish. You know about the you, Einstein but, project in, in Africa? <laughs> no. Looking for the next Einstein. Black Einstein, basically. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's, in Africa. In Africa, right. It's very cool. But I have no doubt in my mind that there, there is somebody a... as talented, yes. you know, in terms of raw intelligence, he or she exists. Yeah. It's the question is, can you create the ecosystem that let Einstein do what he did <laughs> mm-hmm. in Germany and and It's right. a Gary Larson comic. Did you ever see this? There's Einstein playing basketball. Right. Right. And they said Einstein had a promising career as a basketball player until an ankle injury <laughs> turned him to the books. <laughs> to the books. <laughs> <laughs> Became a physicist. <laughs> So what do you what do you have, uh, Chuck? Well, we got our cosmic query. So uh, let's just jump right into it since we already set up the fact of where we get these. Um, the first one that we always take is from a Patreon patron because uh, they support us financially, and uh, and we just put them to the top of the list because right of that. to the top of the list. They pay. They go right to the top of the list. Kind of like Cong- not even ashamed to say no, that. I'm not. It's, okay. it's like Congress and lobbying. <laughs> okay, you know, you so give we have me lobbyists some, for the show. Yeah, yeah you all give right. their lobbyists for the show. You give me some Patreon supporters. You're all lobbyists. Get, uh, right. you I access. say drain the swamp. Let's hear, let's hear from the, let's hear from the freeloaders drain the first. Stars. Drain the galaxy. We're going to drain the galaxy. All right, here we go. Here's our first uh, from Renee Douglas. And says, Renee from P- 
Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, says, why is it important to you that the United States lead the world in science? She's speaking to you directly, Neil. Mm -hmm. Are you just rooting for your own team, so to speak? Uh, or is there a better reason? So what she is, and I, the reason I picked that as the first question is because we just finished talking about the fact that there's a brain drain on other... other uh, yeah, it fits uh, right uh, in. Right. That's so great. it fits perfectly into that. So, okay, what is wrong with the, uh, uh, with an other countries? I mean, are we just, do we just root for America? Or is it possible that if we were to spread the wealth a little bit, maybe science would flourish even more? Maybe we would see even greater... She didn't say, you added all the I'm rest adding, of that. I, okay. always, I always <laughs> add everything to these people's questions because okay. I want I want you to get a little more deep in I got a little bit I put okay. it I got so go I, I got you so so I think it's natural to root for the home team okay and you don't want right. to do that to the point of waging war I think that's my opinion in that regard but you root for the home team and I grew up in the United States in the second half of the 20th century okay. which had a lot of problems of its own you know a, a hot war cold war uh, civil rights movement campus unrest mm -hmm. um, but in there we were going to the moon and we all knew that that required innovations in science and technology we knew this and so I would be upset if that that sense of inventing a future were no longer uh, happening on the soil mm -hmm. in which I was born. I, I would be upset. However, I'd be even more upset if it didn't happen anywhere else in the world. Right. So, yeah, I wanted to have been the one who discovered the Higgs boson in a Texas super collider, right. but it got its budget cut in right. 1993, mm -hmm. having judged, well, what's the value of this? Because I my view is peace had just broken out in 1989 and when peace breaks out who needs physicists right. as far as anybody thinks so the Higgs boson gets discovered in the, in the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland as a European collaboration we're part of that collaboration but right. we're not the leader not the, the well, we're major not, leaders we're not the it. quarterback right, we're not the quarterback we're just on the team on the team we're on the team so, we know that is very un-American <laughs> to not be the quarterback uh, well, you know we're supposed to be the quarterback yeah, we're supposed to be the quarterback uh, we're supposed to be. so as a scientist we're all delighted, but as an American, I, so that's just, I'm just being honest with my feelings there. Right. But if it, as long as it happens somewhere, if the whole world closed down, then we're all moving back into the cave right. together. Dark ages. But, but, but by the way, it does matter to American economics. You yes, know? I mean, it does. Basically, the way you get economic growth is two things. How many people do you have and how much productivity do you have? In other words, it's the, the number of people who are in the workforce, labor, and it's productivity. Wh what are they, how, how productive are, they are, is each of, the, right. uh, are each uh, of those person. people? And productivity rises only through technology, technological innovation, mm -hmm. and science. Yes, right. exactly. And just to be clear, you can uh, – the, <laughs> the, uh, this is a slightly controversial statement, but right. I want to be very frank about it. Go ahead. Um, the times when the arts – grows economically, mm -hmm. in almost every case I've seen, it's because they have been touched by technology, technology and science oh, absolutely. that enables it to occur in well, some I, I think there's also a, way. And there's a mutually reinforcing thing. The arts feed creativity, which allows for, I mean, there's those wonderful stories about Einstein when he would get stuck on a physics problem, he'd st uh, stop and he'd go and start playing his violin. Mm -hmm. And he said that it right. would unlock something in his in his mind that he couldn't uh, understand. So ideally you have a kind of, you know, an there's, inter a, symbiosis in, there's there. a symbiosis in, of creativity. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, I'm just going to add to all that. Um, uh, Renee, uh, you've heard... Uh, Farid and Neil, uh, say, and they were very, very diplomatic. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah, I wanted to be here in America uh, because I live here and this is my country and it's like inviting somebody to your house. One guy you can just have live with you. The other guy says, hey, you know what? I'm going to build an addition. And that's the guy I want living in my house. <laughs> uh, I love this. Christy Borden says this. What does the scientific community think or hope is the next big discovery on the horizon that would be really wonderful? Wonderful if it happened here in the United States. Gosh, there's so many things happening that are extraordinary. I, I mean, I think that if you look at the, some of the most dramatic, um, the new frontiers, I think, are uh, are in biology. Mm -hmm. So if you, my, my eight-year-old daughter is here because she's a huge fan of Neil's. She's sitting outside. And she's cutting adorable. school, I might add. Uh, she's this. cutting school. For this, th this counts as school. <laughs> this counts as school. Um, counts as school. All right. We were talking, she was talking about uh, the brain episode that she was watching about uh, that uh, Neil did on Nova, Nova, Science, Nova, 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 Nova Science Now. Nova Science Now. And if you think about how mapping the brain is going 
going to transform our understanding of the brain and what happens, uh, you know, to medicine mm -hmm. and just to, to knowledge. The, the, you know, this is actually, in, in a weird way, it's uncharted territory. Oh, yeah. It's just well, beginning the, the to understand. The frontiers it. are just that. Absolutely. And then you have. scary, but, but even more exciting. You marry it to the revolution in, in big data, where right. because the brain is going to produce, I mean, the, 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 the volume of data is going to be so large Absolutely. that only the new supercomputing. Brain invented big data. Yes, it did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it seems to me that's the one, but there's so many. I mean, yeah, physics. Yeah, is yeah I, and I, I agree, Fareed. The, the, uh, 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 um, Brain so, neuroscience, neuroscience, yeah. neuroscience, neuroscience. As, a, as a frontier. Uh, also, of course, uh, AI, yes. which is related. Uh, related. Can will we have autonomous robots right. that can think for themselves without having to just solve a problem that you hand it? So that's a. Right. <laughs> They'll come up like, with their own problems. Like, <laughs> say, uh, robot, will you solve this problem? Solve it your own damn self. <laughs> it, <was> like, <laughs> it is self-determining. <laughs> I'm sentient now, Neil. <laughs> you know, they, they now say that AI is getting good enough that computers can do th many of the things that human beings could do. They're, they're having computers do, uh, do editing trailers of movies. Uh -huh. So my question is, when do you think you can get a computer who could tell better jokes than you? <laughs> well, you know, I don't think we're that far. It's not going to happen. No, let me tell you. We're working on that, and it's it's one of the uniquely um, mystery unique mysteries of the world, Fareed. And I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sad if all kinds of people went out of work, but that you maintained your joke? Because that's the one thing computers can do is make us well, laugh. I don't be the only <laughs> profession left. I don't see any sadness in that at all. <laughs> My favorite computer joke ever. This what computer uh, told me this. I think it was controlled by, a, it was a robot, you know, wandering a party. Right. I think there was a, a human somewhere with a, but I pretended it wasn't. So <laughs> they said, well, I asked, where did you learn your, 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 your knowledge of the world? Oh, I went to Solid State University. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Yeah. yeah, I don't think, I think you that You have to have a PhD in physics to get yeah, that, yeah, that no, one. So, <laughs> yeah, no one knows what solid state means anymore. It's, it means no tubes, no vacuum True, tubes. Right, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Solid state, yes. Uh, um, all right. What else you got? Let's go to, uh, you know, I got to do this, Neil, mm -hmm. uh, because I've seen quite a few of these uh, questions come across. And so I'm reading Ben uh, Nuffelkamp's question okay. as a representative to for all of you mm -hmm. who have written this type of question, mm -hmm. not only for this show, but another show that I co-hosted with Bill Nye right. on a similar type of subject. Neil, why does Star Talk have episodes that either have nothing to do or vaguely encompass astronomy, physics, or other science? If I wanted liberal politics, you'll like this part for read. Uh -huh. I just turn on CNN. <laughs> I'm so, okay, so the reason I, I the reason I read that question is because this is not political. What we are talking about. Well, we're talking about just the world as a better place, whatever. And however you slice and dice that politically, right. that's people's own motives. But uh, there is some fundamental reality that has to matter here before that conversation even happens. Right. But but I can address that. I Go can ahead. say I can say um, I could enter this world naively as a scientist and think, oh yeah, science. Let's just do science. But but then you wake up and realize that any science that happens is embedded in a political system. Correct. I'm not an island. Right. And I have to beat my, some of my colleagues over the head who cry foul when NASA spends money on something they don't think they should spend money on the space station or on on the manned program, which has always been a controversial mm -hmm. uh, 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 path of spending relative to uh, pure research. Research, and I go to my colleagues and I say, you are treating NASA as though it's your private funding agency when it was born in a Cold War environment. And there are there are there are geopolitical um, uh, uh, mission statements that NASA fulfills. And you are not the only one in town that it serves. And in fact, the science budget of NASA historically has never been more, it, it maxed out at about 35 percent. Mm -hmm. the, the long term average is around a fourth. Yeah. And all the rest goes to geopolitically driven decisions for what NASA does in this world. And, and if you think about the, you know, the point we were making earlier, if, if American science, if the reason we're the forefront of, of global science is, you know, the three things I, I talked about, Europe got destroyed, two, two world wars, uh, we took in lots of immigrants, and then we spent lots of government money on it. Those are political 
issues. And so if you want to create great science, yes, you have to have great scientists, but you've got to figure out how do you get them? How do you create an environment where they flourish? How do the ideas get All of that is embedded in a political system that's got to recognize that in order to make wise decisions regarding it going forward. That's all. That's it. That's it's it's not more complicated. I mean, it's complicated, but the, the the drivers of it are simple. And it's simple not more understand. political than that. And by the way, this used to be totally bipartisan. It was Eisenhower who set the 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 the, 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 the spending max. Eisenhower was spending three percent of GDP on basic science. Reagan increased the spending. Mm-hmm. It is recently that we have gotten into a situation where everything is political. Right. But this used of to be Lincoln by was Republican. Right. Who, this used to be bipartisan. Not only that, of course, under President Nixon, we formed the Environmental Protection That's Agency. Amazing. Right. And the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Correct. NOAA. NOAA. Right. So yeah, you're right, Free. When I look historically, there's a lot of commingling of political platforms that are in the service of science. And historically, mm-hmm. even the National Science Foundation has been bipartisan, although the motives were a little different, you right. know. Right. Um, so, so yeah. and many would complain that the, the R&D spending under Reagan, a lot of that went to Star Wars, which, were, which many in my scientific community objected to. But at the end of the day, even if the motors are different, right. science gets right. done. Right. So science is political, but we are not politicizing it. So that that's the we're not coming down on one side or another. We're coming down on the side well, of science. One could if well, if there's a political side that doesn't like science. Well, if it's anti-science. We can tell you the consequences of what it is exactly. to be anti-science. Right. That, that's all. We got to take a quick break and we'll be back soon with Chuck Nice and my special guest today, Fareed Zakaria. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. Cosmic Queries in a special installment called Make America Smart Again. I've got Fareed Zakaria as my special guest, and you know this man. I mean, he's a he's a geopolitical genius, and uh, he's got a special feature coming out on CNN. Uh, we wait, have a special. It's, it's a special primetime documentary, uh, one hour on the most powerful man in the world. The president of the United States. Who we say is Vladimir Putin. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Throw down. Trump should love that. We'll, right? we'll, okay. we'll make the case. You judge. Okay. Yeah. Friends. You judge. judge. Fried, I want to hit one thing just to bring some closure to it. When I was in graduate school, at least half of everyone in the sciences and engineering were foreign nationals. And at that time, they would come get their PhDs, their masters, and stay. As the rest of the world rises up and as America fades, we become less of a carrot for those very same graduate students. And I've seen many of them go back to their home country, to China, to India. Will there be a point when they won't even come here as graduate students because those fully trained PhDs now train their own graduate students? And then we have this reverse flux of the intellectual capital of the world? It's a great question. My own sense is it'll be a long time before that happens because the one thing that the United States still absolutely dominates is higher education. If you look at the lists of the top 20 universities in the world, 18 are American. Top 50 in the world, 36 are American. And it, it's hard to design a, a really superb world-class university because there's lots that goes into it. You can't it. do that overnight. You can't do that overnight. Harvard and, and Yale and Princeton have huge advantages having huge. been founded in the 17th century. Huge. That's huge. They have lots of money. They I was compete. Say they're called endowments. <laughs> <laughs> they they That's compete. A huge but advantage. I'll tell you the huge. I'll tell you one piece of it that I wonder about um, when you look at a place like China. At, at the heart of Western science has been the ability to question authority. For the graduate student to tell the professor, you're full of it. Your, your ideas are wrong. I remember reading a your story. Your ideas are outdated, or I got a better idea. Niels Bohr used to begin his lectures. Great physicist. And great physicist from the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. used to begin his lectures in Copenhagen. He'd tell his students, I want, you to, I want to start by telling you you must approach this lecture by assuming everything that I say might be untrue, might be, might be falsifiable. In other words, that sense of really being willing to challenge authority, mm-hmm. that is not yet true in, in a place like China. And I wonder if there's a cultural barrier which will m- mean that it takes even longer for that to happen. I, I've thought a lot about this, and except I came to it from a less noble angle. Mm-hmm. When I see little children in malls, if there's a toddler just steps out of a, a stroller and the parent says, get back in the stroller, he's like, no, I don't want to. Right. That's an American kid. It's also something else that you talked about. We had a conversation a long time ago about um, the fact that 
in other cultures, you may not see the aspirations to do things that we that we take for granted in this culture. Yes. When I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut. Right. Okay. Right, right. What do you want to be when you what do you want to, want to be when you grow up? Even it, and in other countries unreachable goals are actually uh, tamped down. Right. Whereas here, it's like, oh, isn't that, that's it's, cute, go ahead, right. right. But I but I would do want to emphasize, it's important to remember, these are not God-given advantages the United States no, has, and we can lose them very easily if we don't cre- maintain the culture of openness and creativity. We don't want God shed his grace on thee? What, what are you- well, I, I do think there needs, to, but there needs to be a, <laughs> a greater focus on science. You'll like this. I, one of the, my favorite lines from one of Tom Friedman's books, the New York Times columnist, mm-hmm. he was in China, and he was noticing, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates was happened to be there, and people were going crazy over Gates because he was this computer whiz. I mean, yes, he was also very rich, but the combination. And he said, "I guess I've realized the problem. The, the difference between China and India is in China, Bill Gates is Britney Spears. In America, Britney Spears is Britney Spears. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we venerate pop icons. They turn geeky computer scientists into pop icons. Oops, you've done it again, Fareed. Ugh. Okay, All right, give me another one here. All right, here we go." Uh, speaking of what uh, Fareed just said, here's Bob Longmire from Facebook who says this. Given the current political climate, how do you suggest we help advance scientific literacy with people who view science through a negative political lens? Very, very good question. Fareed, how, what is your solution here if I, I'm trying to get people to understand what science is and how and why it works? And they're swept up into a worldview that does not allow that in. That's, what do you do in the world of politics? What has the world done in the history of this exercise? You know, it's very frustrating um, because it's not just an assault on science. It's an assault on expertise. It's an, it's an assault at some fundamental level on knowledge. And I think there's there is a tendency to say that all this knowledge is either biased or opinionated or you have your facts, I have my facts. No, you can't have alternate facts. You can, you can disagree. You can draw your own conclusions on the basis of those facts. How much of that isn't fed? It's fed by the fact that in politics and in religion, people... Are, there, is, there isn't an absolute right or wrong, and so people are accustomed to arguing what they want to be true. Now you add science yeah. to the mix, and they feel like they can have the conversation in the same way. But, you know, I think it's coming at a, at a populist moment where people think that all the experts get everything wrong. Mm-hmm. I was reading the New York Times um, recently. There was an article about Steve Bannon, uh, Donald Trump's chief strategist, who's having everybody read a book called The Best and the Brightest. Mm-hmm. This is a book about how the smart Kennedy advisor uh, got um, uh, America into Vietnam. And the, 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 the moral of the book is meant to be, or the way he sees it, all these experts uh, were, were wrong. Re- disastrously Disaster. wrong. Disaster. In, in fact, if you read the book, what's interesting is actually what it points out is all the, the, the political advisors were overconfident, arrogant. They were not listening to the real expertise of the, of the historians, the people who understood Vietnam, who understood China. And the who, cultures. And the and cultures. The it was, it's actually a story about experts that was ignored because people had a political lens which was anti-communism, which they filtered everything through. Right. Wow. Chuck, what else you got? All right, let's move on, shall we, to Ann Colway. And Anne says, love star talk. Do you foresee the future of international collaborations changing as a result of the new, frankly, barbaric policies that have been put in place? Now, this is maybe when this comes out, this will have changed. But as of now, there is still a so the recording. As so-called, of recording. As of this recording, there's still a so-called immigration ban that was in place. And then a federal judge said no. And that's where we are at this juncture. I, well, I'll, I'll make a statement and I want Fareed to react. Okay. And scientifically. Uh, when we collaborate internationally, we do so at international conferences. Mm-hmm. If they don't happen to be in your department or in your country, you're, you can still collaborate because you get together. We create these occasions okay. where there's an intellectual discourse and there are workshops, there are um, international conferences and the like. So you guys have your own like science date. It's so, like, science yeah. date. You okay. know what I mean? It's <laughs> like you got your own thing. We got our own you, thing. Right. We, and so uh, I've been on multiple papers where there are international collaborations with it. And so, so I can say that I don't require there to be immigration. Okay. For me to still collaborate. The internet enables that. Right. These international conferences enable it. Okay. Um, uh, so, so Fareed, what do you say if all the world is, is this fertile landscape of communication, then who needs immigrants at that point? 
There's no question that you can do more electronically than you ever have been able to before. But, uh, you know, again, it comes back to do we want the United States to be the center, the place where people meet? I remember after 9-11, there was a period where there was similar kinds of, um, you know, pauses and immigration slowdown and increased vetting. We right. didn't call it extreme xenophobia. vetting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of scientific conferences were canceled that were going to be held in the United States, and they held them in Europe. They held them in China. Now, if we, you know, if we keep doing this kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, you, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it certainly will mean that the center of mass, is the center of mass will shift. Right. And frankly, the Europeans are more than happy to pick this up. There's a French presidential candidate. I just read about uh, this. He's, he's, he said, you know, I just want everybody to know anyone who finds that they're having difficulty doing science in America come to France, we wow. will give you, we'll roll out the red carpet wow. for you. And that's the French. That's Let me tell you French. something. And that, <laughs> that alone that's a wake up call. be a huge wake-up call to everyone in this country. That is like Ryan Gosling talking to your wife at a cocktail party <laughs> and says, listen, if this a-hole ever, you. if you ever get tired of this jackass over here, <laughs> hi, I'm Ryan Gosling, you're more than welcome to come over and have coffee. I, I had Let me to tell I, you something, you're going to start treating your woman a little differently. <laughs> I had a similar uh, earlier thought when I was re- I read this news article about this attempt to get ready for the next asteroid so we can deflect it out of the sky. Mm-hmm. And by the time I got to the bottom, it was Russia organizing it, asking who's with them to make this happen. And I said, and I felt like, wait a minute. I was just so expecting that it would be us inviting others to participate. Right. And I realized that this, if when you fade, it's not a cliff. You just sort of slowly right. disappear and everyone else rises up and they, and they have conversations at their table. Exactly. Whether or not you're invited. Right. And you know, I love the fact that you said when you fade, it's not a cliff. Right. It is indeed a slippery slope. And when people use that metaphor, they need to take in mind exactly what the visual is. Yeah. It is a 45 degree <laughs> angle where you are slowly sliding You're down. Just sliding You're down. clawing it, but it's not getting any traction. You're just sliding away. So that's what it is. As out of view. Out of view. We got to have one quick one if you got a quick one. Okay, here's here's a quick one. Uh, and this is uh, for Fareed. As terrible as things as things are, could better relations with Russia improve science and space exploration. Ooh, yeah. Sure. Look, we should have good relations with Russia. We should have good relations with China. We should have good relations with all these countries. Uh, the problem is, you know... And they have Russia, space ambitions, each right, one of them. When Russia invades another uh, its neighbor, when it annexes uh, parts of another country, mm-hmm. you know, something that basically hasn't happened for decades and decades, and it contravenes international order, you've got to do something about it. So there's got to be a way, and we, by the way, managed to do this even during the Cold War, okay. to cooperate, but also have certain rules of the road that matter. But I think that... Wait, wait, just right there. Wait. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want you to go quickly past that. While we were still in Cold War with Russia, we had the Apollo-Soyuz Joint Space Program. Exactly. And this exactly. was like the early signs that maybe we can be friends. So just because there is transgressive behavior in the world from one country to, the, to another, should that, that should not have to stop what might be science or space collaborations. I think, I think in fact, it's all the more reason to do it. Because, you know, you want to build as many bonds as you can between countries. We, we, we don't work better in isolation. There's this wonderful book by Matt Ridley about the, you know, why did human beings manage this extraordinary rise for, you know, from being just, just animals? And the most important thing he points out is whenever we encountered diversity, we, we flourished, you know, just even scientifically. Right. Uh, but as human beings, we, the more we can encounter the other, the more we can collaborate with people who think differently, look differently, study differently, the, the, the end product is better. Who's, who's the, the wit of 100 years ago who said there's no greater pain to the human spirit than the prospect of coming up with a new idea? <laughs> I haven't heard that one, so I think we're going to say it was Neil deGrasse. No. <laughs> so what you say is, I think, can be clearly demonstrated, but there's the the soul speaks differently about who you want to hang out with. We want to create the, the, the homogeneous bubble. But that's why you want to get past your comfort zone right. and into that into that uh, area of unfamiliarity. I think it's, it's hard. It's, it's against, it, it seems to be against human 
human nature to welcome in the people who look different from you and sound different from you and think differently from you and have yeah. a different religion or political ideology. Well, we've been part of the same tribes for thousands and thousands. I mean, if you think about yeah. it, yeah. for most of human existence, we we grew up, we grew old and died one mile from where we were born. Right. And now we're saying all these people who come Abandon from- Abandon that and yeah. embrace and, and the whole embrace world your, as your tribe. And, and, and yeah. even though those tribes are not sending you their best, they're sending you criminals, <laughs> they're sending you rapists. That sounds like it's time to end this episode. <laughs> I think that's uh, We're out of time, Chuck. I'm talking about the tribes. I'm talking about the tribes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chuck, for co-hosting today. And Pleasure. thank you to our special guest, uh, uh, CNN. Uh, uh, what do they call you guys? The, the, your Anchors. Anchors. CNN anchor. Uh, Fareed Zakaria. You all know his show, GPS. Uh, and uh, don't miss it. Uh, I, I try to catch it every weekend. When I don't, I catch it on CNN Go. Uh, so, uh, so, Fareed, thanks for joining us on this special edition of Star Talk, which is the inaugural version of Cosmic Queries where we're trying to make America great again. I'm Neil. Uh, uh, trying to make America smart again. Not- we're trying to make America smart again. Thank you. No, we're trying to make America great again by making America smart again. Ooh. How's that? Ooh. This has been Neil deGrasse Tyson on Star Talk, and we're going to try to keep making America smart again. And until next time, keep looking up. This is Star Talk. <laughs>